Would you consider the problem that a preacher faces? Trying to sell three products to three different people at the same time. Trying to sell salvation to the unsaved, fellowship to the saved, and conversion to the follower. The Apostle Peter was saved in John 1, 42-42. Andrew said, Peter, we found the Messiah, and he brought him to Jesus. Now, that took care of the decision. Andrew had to, de- uh, Peter had to decide to be saved. Either he's saved or he's lost. He had to make a decision to be saved. But that wasn't the only decision he had to make. Now that he's saved, he still faced another decision. What kind of Christian is he going to be? And so, he had to come to the place where he said, I'll leave everything and follow Jesus. But did you know people who have left everything and followed Jesus still have a decision that they must make? And that is, will they be converted or not? Now you say, preacher, explain that. All right, listen carefully, and I will. Every person in this world is divided into two groups, saved or lost, going to hell or heaven, born again or without God. Two thieves on the cross, one on either side of our Lord. One was saved, one was lost. Two men went to the temple to to pray. One was justified, the other was not. One was saved, the other was lost. John 3.18, he that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. There are only two classes of people as God sees them in this room this morning. Either you are saved or you're lost. There's no hope so. There's no trying to be. There's no maybe so. There's no wishing so. Either you are saved and on your way to heaven or you're lost and on your way to hell. The Jews, back in the old days, had what they called the ten awesome days. The ten awesome days. These were the first ten days of the year. Give me a song book. All right, thank you. The, the Jews had what they called the ten awesome days. The Jews thought there were three books. And they thought that the very, very good people had their names written in the very, very good book. That's people who are right with God, they're going to heaven. And the very, very bad people had their names written in the very, very bad book. And they're lost, and they're going to hell. But the Jews thought that since not many folks are very, very good, and not many folks are very, very bad, most of us are in this center group, not good enough to be good, and not bad enough to be bad, and enough good to keep us from being bad, and enough bad to keep us from being good. They thought that most of our names were in the center book, uh, the book Purgatory, if you want to call it that, the Purgatory book. And they had what they called the Ten Awesome Days. January, well, pardon me, April 1 of their first month, 1 through 10. These were the awesome days, and these were the days where everybody got right, confessed all of his sins, so he could get his name transferred from the middle book to the good book during those ten awesome days. Everybody that owed debts would pay his debt um, uh, so he could get transferred from the good book to the real good book. Everybody that, um, that uh, had anything against his brother or against anybody else would, would make it right so he'd get transferred from the good book to the real good book, and those were the ten days. Now, if you really were in bad shape and your name was in the bad book, you could work mighty hard and get transferred from the bad book to the middle book, and the next year you can get from the middle book to the good book. But uh, <clears throat> the truth is, that's not so. The truth is, there is no purgatory. There's a heaven and there's a hell. You're going to heaven or you're going to hell, and the decision is yours. You have to decide. Nobody can do it for you. The preacher can't do it for you. The priest can't do it for you. You can join the church, and that won't do it. You can get sprinkled, and that won't do it. You can get confirmed, and that won't do it. You can get dedicated, and that won't do it. You can turn over a new leaf, and that won't do it. You can live a good life, and that won't do it. You can get baptized, and that won't do it. 
You can take communion and that won't do it. You can take the Holy Eucharist and that won't do it. You must decide one question and one question only, and that is this. Jesus died for you on the cross and paid the penalty for your sins. Now, if you in faith will receive him as your Savior, then God will impart to you his righteousness and impart, impute to Jesus your sins, and Jesus will bear your sins and give you his righteousness, and though you will still be a sinner in the sight of God Almighty, your record will be clear, clean, perfect, because the sins that you've committed have been imputed or imparted to Jesus, imputed to Jesus and his righteousness covers your sin. Now the question is, which are you? Where would you go if you died this morning? You say, I don't plan to die. Neither did that 16-year-old boy that went fishing over here near Tenley Park either. He didn't plan to die. You say, I don't plan to, to face a tragedy. Neither did Governor Wallace last Sunday plan to face a tragedy. Neither did he think he'd be at the point of death before this Sunday. Tens of thousands of people will die tomorrow who did not plan today to die soon. Now, you're going to hell or you're going to heaven. If I don't believe it, that doesn't change it a bit. You're going to hell or you're going to heaven. Either you are saved or you're lost. You either belong to God or you belong to Satan. You're on your way to heaven or you're on your way to hell. And the difference is not what church you belong to, not what... Uh, baptism you've experienced, not what deeds you've done, not what good works you've committed, but the question is, what have you done with Jesus Christ who paid the penalty for your sins on the cross? Now then, you're saved or lost. Oh, let us say this, suppose this morning, you face the issue. You face the issue. You say, I'm not saved. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I'm lost. And I know that I'm going to hell. And so this morning, I put my trust and my faith in Jesus Christ. I receive him now as my Savior. Jesus, I trust you now. And if you're not saved in God's name, do it today. Do it today. Don't take a chance on walking out those doors not prepared to meet God. But if you did, if you did, so you come in, you still face another decision. That decision, the first decision is saved or lost. But a person who's saved faces another decision, carnal, spiritual or carnal. After you come to Christ, then the question is, what kind of Christian are you going to be? Are you going to live after the flesh or after the spirit? Are you going to live uh, a carnal life or a spiritual life? The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth and he says, you're carnal, you're vague, you live after the flesh. He said, I would you grow up and be spiritual. Now, here's the decision you face. Are you going to come to all the services or just on Sunday morning? Or are you going to stay home, watch Ed, Ed Sullivan? Is Ed Sullivan still on? The last time I was home on Sunday night, I was sick. It's been about, oh, 64 years ago. But uh, I was sick, and a little bit of short run came out, and uh, and his name was, is Ed Sullivan still on? Would just some of you morning glories let me know if Ed Sullivan is still on? You folks have just come on Sunday morning. You wouldn't dare say it, would you? But uh, anyway, you have to make a choice now. Are you going to be... Now, oh, you say, I'm saved. I have decided to be saved. I'm going to heaven. I know. But as soon as you get saved, then you face another alternate. You face either spiritual Christian or carnal Christian. Or are you going to come to prayer meeting on Wednesday night? Are you going to tithe and give God tithes and offerings? Or are you going to rob God and be selfish and, and steal God's money? Are you going to read your Bible and become acquainted with God through His Word? Or are you going to just read a verse every once in a while and not ever learn anything about the Bible? Are you going to bow your head and pray before you eat? Or like the ungrateful pig? Or are you going to just bow, your, just, just, just dig in without eating? What was the poem I heard the other day about a prayer I fell up with? I've forgotten. But you used to pray down in Texas. Lord God of the Holy Ghost, what these passages gets the most. Now, at least you can do that. At least you can do that. Uh, or are you going to eat without thanking God? Or are you going to bow your head and say, God, thank you for the food you provided. Amen. Are you going to pray? Or are you going to live as if there were no God? Now, I'm not talking about unsaved people. I'm talking about saved people. 
America's going to hell this morning. America said it for destruction this morning. Not because of the Hollywood crowd. And not because of the president. And not because of the Supreme Court. And not because of the homosexuals. But because we have a generation of people whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, who are born again, they're on their way to heaven, but they live lives as carnal as the unsaved. Carnal Christians. Oh yes, they're saved. But that's all. You girls back in the back room of the balcony, you sit still while I'm preaching. I don't know how you got up there alone, but the fact that you're up there, you sit still. Look at the young lady in the middle. And you hear everything I have to say. Everything I have to say. Kind that misbehaved the most, the kind that needed the most. I'm simply saying, our country is perishing because we have a generation of Christians that don't love God as much as Rat Brown loves communism. We're perishing. Because we have Sunday morning kind of Christians. Half in, half out, half on, half off, half hot, half cold, lukewarm, milk insider Christians who don't give God the tithe. Who don't know what the church looks like on Sunday night. Never come back on Wednesday night. Don't read one chapter a day out of God's blessed book. Don't spend ten minutes a day in prayer with God. Don't even bow your head to thank God for the food that God has given you. You live a carnal, oh, you're going to heaven, okay. But you are carnal on your way to heaven. God will help you to face this morning, face to face, the decision that every Christian needs to face. Is he spiritual or is he carnal? Peter had to face that. Peter had to face it. Peter was already saved, but that didn't, that's not all the decisions Peter had to make. After Peter got saved, he had to face another decision. Will I stay in the fishing business or will I leave all and follow Jesus? Will I be a carnal kind of Christian living like I used to live? Or will I live off? This morning I was walking down the alley. And I met four or five young ladies, pardon me, females, who had skirts on. They looked like harlots. Like harlots. They said, you're going to chase somebody off for preaching like that. I, I never did try to chase anybody on or off. I preached what I thought was true and right. All through these years, and I'm not about to change at 45. But like harlots, sit down, you can see things unlawful to see. And while they stand up, you see things nobody else ought to see. And I said to myself as I walked down the alley, I know they're probably not Wednesday night people. I know they're probably not, maybe even visitors. But I want you visitors to know how young ladies ought to dress while you're here too. Somebody, somewhere, ought to tell you to wear some clothes. Amen. Amen. Well, I won't come back. Well, I'll pluck your tail feathers while you're here then. This sensual, sex crazed, sex minded generation of ours. Young ladies going around causing men, wicked, dirty minded, evil men to have evil, sensual thoughts. God give us sense enough to cover our thighs. And I said to myself, as I walked down the alley, how hard does a fellow have to preach? How hard does a fellow have to preach? Nobody's preached any harder than I have on ladies wearing decent, modest clothing. In spite of that fact, walk down the Listen, you can see as much walking down the alley as you used to see in Burlesque Show. Now, I don't know. I've never been to a Burlesque Show. Dr. Bennings told me that that's true. I have no idea myself. It's time that God's people decided to choose to be spiritual instead of carnal. No wonder the world looks at us and laughs at us. No wonder communism is taking over. No wonder topless bathing suits are becoming the fad. No wonder homosexuality is running wild. Why? Because people are converted, want to live like the world, dress like the world, talk like the world, act like the world, wear their hair like the world, and tell jokes like the world, and read what the world reads, and watch what the world watches, and say what the world says, and sing what the world sings. Rise up, O people of God. You belong to Christ. Live the spiritual life. So Peter faced in his life, shall I be saved or shall I be lost? That wasn't all he faced. He had to face this question after he got saved, shall I be carnal or shall I be spiritual? And so when one day Jesus came and Peter was fishing, and you recall the beautiful, beautiful story? The Bible says that they left, rose up, they left all, 
and followed Jesus. And now he's spiritual. Oh, that's wonderful. Peter has made two decisions. He has decided first to be saved instead of lost. He's come down a road. He comes to a fork in the road. Shall I go this way and be saved, or lost, or this way and be saved? He decides to go this way. But then all of a sudden he finds another fork in the road. Shall I be carnal and go this way, or shall I be spiritual and go this way? And so he chooses to be spiritual. But he finds another fork in the road. The third one. All saved people must choose between carnality and spirituality. But all spiritual people have to make a choice between conversion and non-conversion. Now you say, Pastor, what are you talking about? What do you mean? Is a person converted when he's saved? No, he's not converted when he's saved. Conversion should be a result of salvation, but it is not salvation. Let me illustrate. Back in World War II, I was a paratrooper. Young folks, World War II was a war that was fought way back in ancient history. <laughs> but I stopped to think these kids graduated in high school. Do you know when they were born? Huh? Eighteen years old. Do you know what year, in what year they were born? Huh? 1954. 19, right? 54. That's when they were born. I was three years old then already. Think of it. Good night. I had been preaching almost ten years before you were born. With my young face, can you feature that? Answer me! Back in World War II, I was a paratrooper. I used to jump out of airplanes. That's the idea. And uh, we jumped out of the old planes called C-46s and C-47s. And uh, 18 of us would jump. They had two engines. They were prop planes, of course. Back in those days, no jets. And as you would jump out, you, I, I, you jump out usually, now sometimes both two doors, I think the 46 and they had two doors, the 47 I think had one door in the back. But all of us would jump out, the plane's going this way, we'd jump out the left door facing the front of the plane. And as you'd jump, you'd turn, put your knees and, leg, knees and uh, feet together, uh, hopefully, and bend your knees a little bit. Um, I, so I, I closed my eyes. <laughs> You're not supposed to close your eyes. Somebody asked me how many night jumps I made, I said all of them are night jumps. My eyes were shut on every jump. And uh, and they say you're supposed to hold your nose and holler, Geronimo! I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I, I put, your, put your arms around your reserve chute. And jump. But the thing you have to do is be very careful, that you only made a 45-degree turn to the left as you jump. You're supposed to jump, and then 45 degrees, you turned any more. The prop blast, that's the wind from the, from the, from the engine, would, would get you a, a tremendous kind of a gale, and it would twist you like that. You'd go around and around and around, and the parachute would open. The suspension lines would all be wound around. And so when the uh, war was over, I was out at the airport, Love Field in Dallas, to take a flight. I got on a plane. I said, they said, the walk on board Delta Airlines DC-3 plane. I got on the plane, and I felt... Uh, at home. We're up in the air, and, and uh, I, I said to the stewardess, can I ask you a question? Bill Harvey was on the plane, and he was, he was, he's, he's always kidding me. He said, stewardess, would you turn the fans off, please, on the outside? It's the blowing. But anyway, I said, leave those fans running. But uh, anyway, uh, I said, stewardess, what kind of plane is this? She said, DC-3. We just announced it. I said, uh, has this plane always been a passenger plane? She said, no. No, it hasn't. She said, they used to be called C-47. And I said, don't open the door. She said, why? I said, I might jump. She said, what do you mean? And I said, I used to jump out of C-47. And she said, mister, she said, after the war was over, they converted all 
those plans. They converted all of those plans. What did she mean? She meant that that plane was once used for something else, has been reconditioned, the old purpose has been changed, there is a new purpose, that which was used for a war is now used for peace. It has been converted. Now listen to me. Listen to me. Here's a, Chris, here's a person who's an unsaved person. He smokes. He drinks. He lies, never reads his Bible, never bows his head to pray, never says grace. Now that he comes down the aisle one day, he gets converted. Now see, I use the same word you use. He gets saved. He receives Christ. But he goes back, he still does not read his Bible. He still does not pray. He still uses dirty words. He still reads Playboy magazine, God pity a nation that will buy that kind of garbage. He still doesn't come to church on Sunday night. Still doesn't come to church on Wednesday night. Is he saved? Yes. But he's not converted. His body is being used exactly like it was before he got saved. Listen. Delta Airlines goes to the United States Army and says, we'd like to purchase all your C-47s. Now then, listen to me, listen. Does the United States Army own the C-47? When it, when it sold to Delta Airlines, now who owns it? Tell me. Delta Airlines. Does the Army own it? Does it have a new owner? Okay, but suppose that paratroopers still jump out of it, even though it's owned by a new owner. Is it converted? No, it's not. The ownership makes no difference about its conversion. The conversion comes when the use is changed. Let me ask you a question. Are you converted? Or you say, I'm saved. Are you converted? Are your habits like the, like the unsaved? Then you're not converted. Is your language like the unsaved? Then you're not converted. Young lady comes to Christ, doesn't lengthen her skirt, she's not converted. She's saved, but she's not converted. No man comes to class, doesn't get a haircut or a decent link there. He's saved, but not converted. Man comes to Christ and doesn't quit his smoking. He's saved, but not converted. Conversion means using the body for something else other than the original use. Peter came, he came to the place where he had to choose. Lost or saved. He chose to get saved. He came to the place where he had to face another decision, to be carnal or spiritual. He chose the spiritual, but he faced another decision. You can be spiritual and not converted. A lot of folks I know that pray that never want a soul. A lot of folks I know that study their Bible verse by verse and never do start a bus route. Never bring anybody to church. Never change their lives. Oh, this, you can, I know what they call me in town. I know what they say. I know what I'm called. I was out here at Munster Shopping Center not long ago, walking down the shopping center. And what, a big family walked back by, and, and one young lady, teenage girl, said, the mama said, uh, who's he? And she said, that's Reverend Hiles from down on Sydney Street. And the girl whispered something to her mother and came over and did, and spit on me. And that boy did the same thing. I know what they say. You know why she stood on me? Because I believe in decency. I'm against the liquor traffic. I'm against the narcotic traffic. I'm against communism. I'm for America. I'm for the Bible. I'm for clean living. I believe Christian people all be different from the heathen world. Yet converted, my beloved friend. Let the people of Hammond criticize First Baptist Church if they will. But let them see there's something different about our people and the world. We've not only been saved, but we've been converted. Let me take three illustrations and listen carefully, and I'll explain exactly what I'm saying in my sermon. Across the street over here, we used to have an apartment, several of them. Our church bought all of them, <laughs> except the one that's there now. And for a season, we kept renting that apartment. Now listen, we kept renting that apartment. 
to other people. Same people lived in for a while that lived in before we bought it. We owned it, right? But it was still occupied with the same people. The same things went on in that apartment that went on before we bought it. Those who drank kept drinking. Those who smoked kept smoking. Boys and girls, listen over here. Same thing went on. No change at all. Now, there was only a change of ownership. Now, I'm talking this morning to a lot of people in this room who've only had a change of ownership. That's all. Aren't you ashamed to call yourself a Christian? And the only difference in your life is that you receive Christ as your Savior? Don't you think God deserves more than that? Okay, so you've been saved. Now let me say this. Many of you are just like that apartment building. You're owned by God, but you're no use to God at all. Now, let me give you a second illustration. <laughs> there was a same, same, other same, same point. Over here there used to be a diner. Greasy spoon kind of a place. The other day I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and there's a health food fellow down there. Owns a health food store. I mean, bought carrot juice and seven grain bread and natural vitamins and all the rest of it. They even have a little restaurant there and serve, they serve only natural foods. Tremendous place. When I go to Tulsa, I always go there. And I, the other day I, I said, uh, called him my name and I said, why are you so fat? Most people that go, you know, eat health foods are not, not very fat. I said, why are you so fat? He said, don't let my wife hear this. Oh, there. I said, what? I'm going to tell you why I'm so fat. He said, I know I've got a health food store, but he said, about every other day, there's this little greasy spoon place around the corner down here. I go down there and just get filled. Now, we used to have one of those places over here. We bought it. For years, same owner had it. He paid us rent. Now, we own it, Right? We own it. It was ours, but no change of what went on. Like the saved man who's carnal. Now, there's a second illustration. Over here across the alley this morning, there's a building that's empty. It used to be the Worth Furniture Store. In fact, the big sign is still on it, Worth Furniture Store. We bought, we bought it. No longer is there a furniture store. But it's empty. Now, bear in mind, nobody curses over there. Nobody gambles over there. Nobody drinks over there. Nobody smokes over there. Nobody lies over there. Nobody lives in wicked sin over there. But it's empty. You follow me? We bought the first one, no change. This one we bought, and it is no longer carnal. There's a building down the next block called the Hammond Baptist Grade School. We bought that from a church, liberal in theology, they would admit it, liberal in theology. We bought it. They didn't stay in it, see, so it's not carnal. But we didn't leave it empty either. Now, it is being used for the joy of God as a Hammond Baptist Grade School. Now listen to me. Every Christian in this house is either like the Temple Diner, the Worth Furniture Building, or the Hammond Baptist Grade School. Now th think for a minute. Where are you? Where are you? Think. Where are you? Are you living any different from before Jesus brought you? Are you any different from what you were back yonder before you got redeemed? Oh, you say, thank God, I'm saved, okay. But is it like the temple diner or the same things going on that were going on before you got saved? You're saved, but you're not spiritual. You're carnal. You say, well, of course, preacher, I don't, I don't drink, I don't use dope, I don't curse, I'm clean. Okay, then maybe you're like the worth furniture building. You never win a soul, never teach a Sunday school class, 
Never run a bus route. But you're clean. You're spiritual. You're not carnal. You're spiritual. But you still have other growth. Or are you like the Hammond Baptist Spirit School building? Both spiritual converted. Now, the Temple Diner was not a converted building. It was bought with ours. The Worth Furniture Store is not yet a... And by the way, most of you are Worth Furniture Companies. You're worth less. You don't do what's wrong. You're great. Listen, you can sweep that building out. You can paint the walls. All you want to, but it's not converted till its use is changed to do constructive something for God. Now, who are you? There are folks out here this morning who are temple diners. Saved on your way to heaven, but that's all. Same language the world uses. Same literature the world uses. Same television programs the world watches. Same magazines. Same books. Same radio programs. You're redeemed. You're born. You belong to Christ. The same things going on that went on in the building before you got saved. And then there's those like the worst furniture building. You're spiritual. You're not carnal. But you're not doing anything for God. You have not been converted. May I say this morning, if you're saved but not spiritual, may I beseech you to ask God to cleanse the sins of your life and give everything you have to God. May this morning, if you are spiritual but you're not converted, may I say to you, let Good come from your life. Get you a bus route. Go out and win souls. Get you a Sunday school class. Work for God. Become converted. This morning, as these kids, we laughed a bit. <clears throat> they walked across the front. But as they did, and as they sat down, and I sat down here, I said, Oh, God, use them. Use them. Oh, the prayers that have gone into these kids. I've sat in my office and wept with these with these kids, however many they were. I've wept with them. And I've pleaded with them to give all they have to God. And I've said, don't sell short. Don't come short. I sat yesterday morning in my study with numbers of kids. And, and this week with numbers of kids. And I said, don't stop short. Don't stop short. Turn from sin. Don't let your body be a vessel of dishonor. But more than that, let God use you. Be converted. Be converted. Be converted. Saved, but not converted. You say, preacher, I'm not saved. May I ask you a question? Are you going to heaven? How many can say this morning, Brother Hiles, I know that if I died today, I'd go to heaven. I'm on the right side. I'm saved, and I know it. Raise your hand way up high, would you please? All right, you can drop your hand. If you did not raise your hand... May I beseech you this morning to say yes to God. But everyone whose hand was raised, you still face another crossroads, another fork in the road. Or are you spiritual? Or carnal? You sound spiritual. Then are you converted or unconverted? Would you bow your heads for prayer, please?